Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Bad Times Good Stories Podcast. My name is Joe Flanders. Hope you're having a good week, and um, I'm glad that you're here listening or watching. Today on the show, uh, Martin Morrow is returning. Um, he is a comedian, a very funny one at that. He's also a really great writer. He's written a number of pieces for Medium, online publication that I think is writing some really great and um, important pieces about everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, I wanted to have him on today to talk about microaggressions. Um, he posted on uh, his social media about a number of times that, um, you know, him being black uh, affected him. Uh, and, you know, I've been reading a lot about microaggressions and um, I thought it would be, you know, a good opportunity to talk with him about that and how, you know, from somebody who doesn't have to deal with that stuff on a daily basis, one isolated event, you know, it's easy to scoff at or say, oh, well, you know, it's not that big a deal, shrug it off. Um, but taken in the, the macro level, uh, you can see how it really would wear somebody down. You know, we need to have important conversations about race. And, um, you know, I know that this show is, is kind of a storytelling podcast and, and uh, oftentimes is, is funny. And um, these aren't necessarily hilarious, but I think they're really important conversations. And selfishly, I want to have these conversations and, uh, and do as much listening as I can. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, so thank you, Martin, for coming on and, and uh, talking with me about all this. Um, you know, we've there's definitely been some progress but there's in the last couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, almost every day there's just as much negative things that continue to happen. So uh, I think until we can all just sort of learn and, and have empathy for others and, uh, you know, respect other people's points of view and where they came from, um, then, uh, you know, I think bad things are going to continue to happen. So progress has been made, but there's still a lot of work to do. And um, on a personal level, I just want to keep having these types of conversations. So hope you enjoy the episode. Martin, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, thanks, thanks for having me again. Yeah. Um, uh, just to kind of dive into everything that's going on, I did want to say you're a comedian, and I noticed that you've been doing a lot of, you know, digital shows and stuff right now. And uh, I'm just wondering... How are you finding the funny in everything that's happening right now? Um, I, I think a lot of funny comes from the absurdity of, uh, I don't want to say the other side, but just having to kind of deal with people who either don't want to see what's going on or are so against it that it's like, how could you, it, it, like, like um, I'm, I'm trying to think of like a good example, but just the idea sure. of like, oh, uh, uh, it's, it's not fair that they don't want to get killed by police. Like that kind of thing is just right. so beyond me of, of, uh, of, a, of, a, a, a stake to really like the hill to die on in 2020. It, it's, it's so weird. And I guess, you know, yeah, it's probably healthier to laugh, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, there's you can laugh all the time, but yeah, it, it's, you know, it's, you have to laugh until we can vote. And, right. and so we can like yeah. get this guy out of office or I mean there's so many changes that need to be implemented all around and right. I'm glad that other people are finally starting to see it I feel like I've been kind of you know screaming into the void for the past four five six years about police reform um, and even really I think I wrote an article about when Ahmaud Arbery uh, right. was killed about how much we need the justice system to be reformed to uh, really reflect like what's happening in the world. And it's, you know, it, justice, prison, and police that those three things need to be changed as immediately. Right. Oh, absolutely. And I was going to ask you about that. Um, uh, if I'm correct, that was your last article that you wrote for medium. Yes. Okay. So I'm wondering, did you, do you just get to a point where you run out of words to say, about these things because it has you know like it just what else can you say like when the same thing keeps happening and over over and over again um how do you as a writer just manage to not, i mean it probably just feels like you're repeating yourself i mean i know that 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 situation didn't technically an on-duty officer wasn't involved 
he was, yeah. uh, you know, retired or off duty. I can't remember, but retired. Um, yeah, retired. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I guess I'm just asking, was, did you think about writing something for, uh, for uh, George Floyd or are you just out of, out of words? Well, it, it's interesting because at the end of the piece about a mod, I mentioned how, you know, it's like, you know, how long till it's another hashtag till it's another, you know, situation just like this. A yeah. And then we just kind of keep this cycle going. And so it, it was that it was like, I, I, I said it already. And now here it is two weeks later yeah. that it's happening again. And that's what was so disturbed. Like the, the, the elements that are always disturbing to me are the initial killing and lack of justice uh, in reaction. Then we have that, you know, that, that kind of reaction to the killing that lasts like what, two, three weeks usually. And then people just kind of get tired of it and move on to the next thing. And then you have uh, within the midst of that, the, well, you know, he did this one time and da 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 da. Like, and, and with, with George Floyd, we found, you know, people saying, "Ah, oh, well, you know, apparently he had this condition and he would have, he was sick and, uh, oh, he, you know, he, he did, he like worked in porn or he did this, that, and the third. It's like, none of that shit matters. No, uh, this guy not got, at all. Yeah. This guy had someone on his neck for over eight minutes. Breonna Taylor was sleeping in bed and was shot eight times. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery was shot with a shotgun. They're like, oh, he shouldn't have been looking in da 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 or, or, or I, I think one one person I saw said uh, he, he shouldn't have tried to fight the person with a shotgun. It's like they boxed him in with trucks yeah. like while jogging. And, and, and if I have my headphones on and I'm jogging, I'm not going to listen to a stranger in a truck yelling at me. That makes no, no. sense. No one would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but people try to justify because they, they, they don't want to rationalize either someone who looks like them or who looks like their uncle or their dad or their grandpa or, or whoever, or the people who they, you know, we, we become desensitized not only to black death, but also the idea that cops are the good guys because, you know, we, we grew up on police Academy and Turner and Hooch and, and Brooklyn nine, nine and all this kind of shit that really makes them seem like the kind of like good guys and goofy and they're going to save the day. But that's in reality, that's not always the truth. No, and I think if I've learned anything um, and noticed anything just in the last three weeks, it's that so much of it is just perspective and point of view and not acknowledging others' perspectives and points of view, where it's like, generally speaking, white people may, may have a favorable view of the police because they're protecting the neighborhoods they live in. Yeah. Uh, and this is all generalizations, um, but I think that there's like, the instantly people are discounting, mainly white people are discounting how African Americans grew up, what the world that they know. It's not, they're not making this up. It's a reality that, you know, slowly people are starting to, including myself, are starting to pay attention to. And, you know, it's just, I think that so many people are instantly going on the defensive um, because it makes them uncomfortable to acknowledge that maybe things aren't so rosy. Um, but uh, so yeah, I you know we we I wanted to tell you you posted on Facebook just a number of of incidents that have happened throughout your life um, uh, that I I guess you would categorize as like microaggressions. Does that minimize what they were? Um, no, I, I think okay. for the yeah I think for the most part a lot of them were microaggressions uh, because it, so some some things like I I grew up in Alabama and a thing that I get asked all the time is like oh was it like racist growing up there what was it like growing up there and I always say I didn't notice anything till I left and was like oh that was bad like that's not something that's supposed to happen to a child or even an, anybody. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure if you saw, there is one comment. So I mentioned that in the second grade uh, <laughs> at, a, at a teacher who, you know, you, you know, when you're a kid, you have like designated bathroom times and whatnot. And when we got back to the classroom, I think she was teaching math or whatever, or just, she was just talking. And I sat in the front row. I remember I sat on the front right side um, and I had to use the bathroom really bad. And I'm raising my little hand and I'm like, hey, you know, and I started, I started kind of like standing up like Miss Tomlinson, Miss Tomlinson, and she's ignoring me the whole time. And I say like, I, I, you know, I'm trying to like get her attention to use the bathroom. 
and I can't go any, you know, can't go any longer. I, I know that I have to go, but I don't want to be rude and just get up and leave and go to the bathroom. So I ended up paying myself. And uh, so then after I've, you know, kind of finished paying myself and I just sit down in my pee, like, all right, well, that happened. Uh, she's like, okay, Martin, now what do you want? And I'm like, well, I, you know, I already peed myself, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter now. She's like, no, you didn't. I go, yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I, I'm covered in my, like, I'm feeling my, I know I'm there. It's pee right here. She's like, no, you didn't. And just went right back to teaching. Um, and some, some, uh, this kid who I guess, I think he was like two years older than me was like, no, she wouldn't do that. That, that's not, that's not racist. But I mean, she's racist. She was the nicest person I met. She was one of the nicest teachers I met. It's like, okay, so because your experience was different than mine does not invalidate my experience because you're a white, you're a white guy. Right. Uh, and that, that doesn't, and that's not even to say that what she did was uh, racist, but it was something she did to a child who was black. Right. Um, and, and beyond the, beyond the aspect of letting me sit there and pee myself, she gaslit me. She lied to me and told me you didn't do the thing you just did because she was a person in authority. She was the teacher. She was the older person. There were so many different dynamics and ways she could have handled that situation. And I think she did it easily the worst possible way oh absolutely yeah. and and that comment you know like he basically you know the person who discounted your experience is basically gaslighting you too where it's just like yeah you i don't acknowledge what you're telling me it's it's yeah. not real you're and again it's just about i mean i like my high school alumni page on facebook um some african-american guys that graduated a handful of years ago posted something basically just saying and look, I went to like a, a Catholic school that was probably, I'm going to guess my class of like 200 was probably 85% white. Um, and, you know, basically just said, hey, uh, if you had any of these, you know, if, if you experienced racism while attending the school, please let us know. We're going to compile a list and send it to the principal or whatever. And almost all of the comments are just white people who graduated in the 70s and 80s doing what you're saying, discounting it completely. Um, you know, everybody was treated equally and fair and da, 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 da. And, and it's just, uh, I just, I'm trying to figure out how to get the message across to just take a step back and look at it from somebody else's point of view and acknowledge that like, they couldn't talk about what it was like to be white in high school. And you can't talk about or assume that, you know, somebody who was black had the same experience as you. And I don't know how to, you know, get that point across. I think the the thing is that a lot of people need to realize it's okay to be wrong. Yeah. We we especially as adults and and even more so older people uh have this kind of inherent idea that being wrong is wrong for lack of a better term. Yeah, sure. That like the, that the worst thing you can do is be wrong about something or or not see a person or event or group or whatever uh, in a particular light or way. I, I think we've, we've grown so accustomed to good and bad, right? Yeah. And I think I, I may have said it last time on the podcast, but uh, this, a quote that always stuck with me is, uh, the villain is just the hero whose story we haven't heard, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I try to, you know, rational, like I, I've talked to friends of mine who are cops and stuff like that and heard their kind of experiences and whatnot, but I think the thing that I've come to realize from talk from talking to them and listening to them is that every cop wants to be kind of known or thought of as the good guy. Uh, but they, they don't want to have the sort of experience of, okay, maybe we, maybe we fuck this one up. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we need to take a step back and, and relearn some things. But again, that, that goes back to the idea of people being afraid to be wrong. And that, that's, you know, that's essentially what your, you know, your, 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 the people who went to your school and graduated years and years and years ago, what they're kind of going through is the idea of, well, no, I had a good experience, so everyone should have had a good experience. I, I didn't see this thing. So if, if I didn't see it, then it can't be true. And, and it, I don't want to be wrong in my view of this school. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't necessarily make the school bad that means no. that the school itself is also learning they're, they're trying to change and trying to grow same thing with like like second city 
uh, got called out for a lot of, um, you know, racist microaggressions. And right, I even the comedy theater for anyone who doesn't know. Yes, the Second City Comedy Theater, not not the entire city of Chicago, <laughs> which is also problematic. But we'll, yeah, well, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, but hey, what U.S. city isn't? Um, yeah. yeah, but you know the. I, I saw people kind of like fighting back and like, no, uh, they hired a lot of diversity. It's like and the, the way I explained it to uh, those friends who saw it that way of like, no, they, they can't be wrong because I saw them hire black people and Mexican people and blah, 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 is if I say, hey, I'm searching for Bigfoot, I'm going to look for Bigfoot. My plan is to find Bigfoot. And then once I capture Bigfoot, I then murder him and skin him and like wear Bigfoot's hide. That doesn't mean I did a good job of finding Bigfoot. I, I did the thing of finding him, but I did a bad job of what I did once I got Bigfoot. And I think that's what we're kind of seeing in a lot of these like diversity and inclusion, and we're gonna you know do better about that and da 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 da. Um, we we have to learn, we have to change, we have to grow, and we have to like acknowledge where we're accountable and where we fucked up. Right. And so uh, I don't know if you have one, but like, what are, you know, what's an example of maybe specifically with Second City where their attempt at diversity really kind of didn't work? There was a, a show we did where, and I, I think this is the thing that kind of blew up on Twitter with Second City and why like uh, the, the CEO stepped down and stuff. But we had a show we did where um, we we're doing a Black Lives Matter show. and we were supposed to put it on, but they said, oh, we can't, we can't have you do it unless you give half the proceeds also to the Chicago Police Department, which was like, why would we do that? This, this is the, they're, they're the people who are killing us. It defeats the purpose entirely. Exactly. Um, and so there was like this back and forth of not being able to put on the show. And then we were like, we're not going to do the show if we have to do this. And eventually they let us do it but it just it, it it came at the kind of regard of knowing in the back of our heads that there are people in the building who didn't want us to put this show on or who didn't want this show to go on without like yeah but we also love police so mm -hmm. it, it, it's like shit like that you know sure and when was that that was i believe also 20 2015 2016 somewhere okay there. Yeah. and that kind of speaks to and i it has been encouraging, at least to me, I'd love to get your take on it. Um, the number of, you know, it, it feels like while it's still quote unquote political to a degree, it feels like it's becoming less controversial or political to just fucking say black lives matter. It seems yeah. like there's been some progress in that direction. And I think it's, you know, even five years ago, I'm sure they were like, well, you know, we don't want to alienate half of our audience. And yeah. You know, with, and by doing that, then they're not looking at the whole point of doing the show in the first place. Uh, so does it seem like, you know, is it encouraging that that companies are, you know, that on if I get on Netflix or Amazon to watch something, they have a whole Black Lives Matter section. I know that on one hand, you could just say that they're pandering or it's the, the um, Virtue popular signal. thing at the time. But, you know, how do you personally kind of, uh, you know, interpret all that? I have kind of two takeaways from it. On on one end, I am very grateful and happy to see this message kind of being spread. You know, all 50 states had protests. Uh, I think it was 13, 14 different countries. Um, and yeah, like you said, place like Na like having NASCAR essentially fight for Black Lives when there's you know I don't I think I've been I've been to one NASCAR race my entire life. And that's because he uh, lived in Alabama. <laughs> that's because I lived in Alabama. If I didn't live there, I would not, <laughs> by any means, have gone. Um, but like, but it, it, but you you do see some change, and you do see that it is creating uh, is creating a narrative. It's creating a a, a a discussion that is well needed. That's that 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 I hope will continue. And I think that's that's my one fear is if all of this is performative, if it's, you know, like you said, um, just kind of like in the vein of, oh, it's popular at the moment. And, we, we, you know, we've seen the influencers. Like, I know there was the, the, the lady who, uh, when they were boarding stuff up, she went and asked if she could hold the drill and took the picture and then like yep. hopped in her car and drove off. Yep. Uh, 
so, so stuff like that bothers me or, or stuff like the, the, the black box on, on uh, Instagram or um, I even had, there was a girl who she, she posted like a lot of black lives matter stuff and like made a video and all this. And I remember I, I called her out and said, you called me nigger like in your home, not even seven years ago. Uh, and she was like, that never happened. I was like, dude, I've been talking about, th- you apologized to me for this, like not even four years ago, but like it was, it was such a, it was a bullshit apology then because now you're trying to deny the fact that this thing happened. And even in the fact that you're denying it, the fact that you're, you're, you're not even saying like, oh, okay, maybe I did do that. Or, you know, maybe I should be, you know, look at it from perspective, woo, woo, woo. But just to be like, no, this is a lie. That never happened. It's like, you know, it happened. You, you said, I, I will never forget that because you looked me and I, I said, hey, I don't like it when you say that. It makes me uncomfortable. You smiled, you slowed down and you said it again. And it's like, I, that's, yeah. So it's like, and, and her justification was like, well, I, I fuck a black guy. So it's fine. Da, 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 da. But like that kind of thing is what does make it uh, performative and make it very like surface level. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm on the good side. It's like, but if you're not, if you're not able to hold yourself accountable, if you're not able to justify the reason that you're doing this now, or at least say, yeah, I used to, I used to be a shitty person or I, I did this thing, then, you know, I, I don't know if I really want to hear from that person, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, but to get back to, to your post and everything else, I, I guess I want to try and just paint a, a, a picture of what it is to be black in this country, you know? Um, The things that happen on a daily basis, that it's easy for an uninformed person who can't think about the perspective of others to just scoff at it and be like, oh, that you're playing the race card, or, you know, like, how do you know that, you know, you're forcing the issue, or whatever it is. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess, however you want to take that broad question, um, but yeah, what do you, I mean, I, I think that in a lot of ways, so I, I, I had posted something that was like, um, people don't really love black people unless we're entertaining them. Mm-hmm. And I find that sentiment to be true when you look at like the, the, the context of shut up and dribble, right? As I said about like yeah. LeBron and other prominent basketball players. Yeah. Um, but on the, on the other end of that, when Drew Brees was like, I think you should stand for the flag. Uh, and you, I think it was Laura Ingram for Fox News who who said like, yeah, he we should he should be able to voice his opinion. What was the same yeah. person who said, you know, you shouldn't talk about uh, political issues or things of that nature. Um, so th- you you can't look at like the NFL or the NBA or or comedy or whatever without seeing a black face. And I think so often when we see that and you see the the makeup of the audience it is a lot of like angry white dudes or like you know or you know even sometimes white women who 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 kind of still have these biases but it is in the idea of well if you're if you're entertaining me if you're winning for me if you're playing for me then I'm fine watching that but if you say anything outside of that then that's going beyond the realm of what I'm willing to hear or comprehend you're not supposed to for i think for a lot of white people it's the idea of you're not supposed to think you're not supposed to speak just do the thing that i want to see mm-hmm. um i think we just saw like ben shapiro said something similar of like oh, i can't enjoy sports anymore because everything's been politicized it's like but it's it's always been that way every every sport every piece of entertainment has some hint of 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 uh if it's good an education or a message or a thing behind it right right and that's you know i think that's the way that a lot of us are viewed and on the other side of that um like i've had i've I've had this kind of discussion with with white women about like what's tougher being uh being a black guy or being a a white lady and uh, you know oftentimes oh well i'm scared to walk home and I'm scared to you know go down an alley or someone might hit on me or someone might rape me or things of that nature which are all valid points uh my thing is I have those same fears 
but I also have to worry about if a cop is going to kill me. If a, if the person I'm supposed to hold on to, to protect and serve as they are sworn to do in their duty, if they will then in turn say like, you know, we saw the, the video in Decatur where the, the, the liquor store owner got robbed by a white guy and the cops let the white guy go. And then they broke the jaw of the liquor store owner who was black uh, because they thought that he was the one who was inciting the, the incident and arrested him. So it, it's, it's that fee, it's that like, it's the fear that everyone else has. But on top of that, the layer of like, you know, will this, will this person see me as a threat? Like I, I walk my dog at least three times a day. And the other day I, I, I was walking her in the morning and I, I waved at a neighbor. I'd never seen him before, but I said like, good morning. And he didn't respond. And that like that kind of thing of, Oh no, does he think I don't belong here? Will this become an issue? Will he call the police? Is he going to be concerned about my presence? Will that escalate to a situation? Like these are thoughts that have to cross my mind anytime I walk my dog. And so that um, right there, it would be easy for a white person to say, dude, you're overreacting. Like, come on. It was just maybe he had his headphones in, maybe the, and just discount those fears. So where do those, and this may be a stupid question, but where does, why is it that that is how, that's where you instantly go to when somebody doesn't say, you know, good morning back? Um, because I feel like we've seen it so often where, uh, you know, so some people have seen it, some people have lived it. I've, I've had uh, a situation of a person calling the police on me because they thought that I was not where I was supposed to be. They thought I walked aggressively or they thought that I, uh, I, I remember when I was, I was 16, 17 years old. I think this is one of the things I wrote about actually. Um, but me and my friend, Steve, who's a, a Lebanese guy, uh, and this is, again, this is like kind of small town Birmingham, Alabama, where they don't know, especially 2005, 2006, they don't know what, the, what a Lebanese person is, you know? Right. Uh, and they, they see us talking to these girls and, you know, in their mind, oh, look at that, look at that black guy and that whatever guy harassing these girls. And next thing you know, you know, some, it, was, it was literally the cops said it was a lady driving by who called it in. But not even three minutes after that, having five, six cop cars surround me I'm a, I'm a, as, as a teenager and searching my car. Like, there's, no, there's nothing that within that phone call, within that incident should have uh, gone to, oh, we should search, search his car. But that's right. where it went. And if that, imagine if they found something or imagine if, um, if they just, if some cop just wasn't having a good day, that that could have been the end of me. That could have been the end of him. That, that could have been a lot of what if scenarios, but we, we live through these. We see these, uh, we, we see the, the, the lack of deescalation. We see the lack of comprehension of compassion in a lot of ways, empathy, sympathy, all these things that lead to our deaths that lead to our arrest that lead to our brutalization. And, because we see it so often and so frequently and we've seen it for so long, that is why those feelings are validated. I hate that the, I hate that this wasn't fixed a while ago. You know, I feel like after Tamir Rice, this should have stopped. I feel like after Ferguson essentially burned down, it should have stopped. I feel like the fact that George Zimmerman is still around and like had the ability to auction off the gun that he killed Trayvon Martin with that, that speaks volumes of where we are as a country. Right. And that doesn't reflect on, you know, you as a white ally or me as a, a black person, but it does reflect on a part of this country that's so ingrained in racism that they don't want to acknowledge it, but also feel the need to say, yeah, I'll buy that George Zimmerman gun. Cause I think he was protecting his neighborhood. That, that tells you that there's still a long, long, long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, what I was going to say is speaking to, you know, why you would have those concerns about the guy who didn't say good morning back to you. What was really eye opening for me is I don't know if you saw the, the clip. It was Fox LA when they were covering the, um, you know, when the protests also had the looting contingent and all that stuff. Um, it was, I was watching it live where there was, um, 
you know, uh, a, a liquor store that was owned by, I'd say, Middle Eastern people. And um, they had some African-American friends who were there helping to basically, you know, they were armed, you know, because yep. they weren't going to have looters break in uh, or, you know, um, loot. And, um, you know, they did a whole interview with, with the black people that were there and kind of explained who they were and why they were there. And then live on TV, looters showed up and then kind of stayed back because they saw that they were armed. And then a cop car drove by. The, the people that were defending the store um, flagged them down. The cops came out and then instantly handcuffed all the black people and the looters got away. Yeah. And the reporter is on the air live saying, no, no, they're the ones protecting the store, you know, and, and it was just shocking to see that live, to see all the things that so many of my African American friends and things have alluded to that I didn't, I couldn't understand other than intellectually. And I think, you know, that now I understand. It's like that right there is, is and you know, their excuse was that, you know, in a, in a high tension situation, they saw somebody was armed, they, inst you know, they, you got to force first and ask a question a second. But like that easily, if any of the people who were getting cuffed had been even in the slightest bit confrontational about it, I, we may have witnessed a murder on live TV. Yeah. You know? And, and I think the, the, um, the ability to remain calm under something that is so infuriating, I think it's just, uh, I don't know how, you know, you I'm sure you felt that in any interaction with the police, the rage, you just have to bottle it up for the sake of your life. Oh yeah. I mean that, police incidents, incidents with the HR department, incidents with neighbors, really, you know, like, it's funny, I, I, this is a story I told earlier about, uh, you know, the, the neighbor not like waving at me. So his, I guess his grandson or somebody was like, scoot, like on a scooter in the, on the sidewalk. And this guy immediately gets his kid back onto the yard. And they're just like, sitting on the yard, I guess, so we could walk by. But you know, we easily like the fact that he moved his chair too. That was like kind of weird to me. Mm. So then my dog, like my dog's very friendly, and she walked up to the guy, and he was like, "No, no, no get out of here!" And not not in like a "I'm scared of dogs" kind of way, but like uh, j just like things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I I can try to rationalize it and justify it and think, you know, figure out, oh, maybe it's this. Maybe he's scared of dogs. Maybe he doesn't like dogs. Maybe. He's scared of COVID, but I was like, he doesn't have a mask on. So it can't, it can't, you know, you, you right. then find, you find those other moments and those things of like, well, no, this, this wouldn't factor in because of this. And, and the fact that I even have to try and rationalize what was some form of prejudice, you know, be it, be it racist, be it, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's something that's got to change. Um, I shouldn't rationalize someone else's shitty behavior. Right. Yeah. And you almost have to just to get through the day, right? Yeah. J just so that way I can remain calm in that situation. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's because if I blew up at him, then I, you know, he calls the cops. Oh, there's a scary black guy, da, 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 which I've been called. I've been called. You've, you've met me. I've yeah. been called a scary black guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In what context? Um, let's see. The, the, the last time I can recall was there's some, some improv kid who, like a, a mutual friend of ours is like, hey, Brad was, I, don't, I, don't, I, probably, well, I didn't say his last name, fuck him. Uh, <laughs> he, was like, he was like, hey, Brad was, Brad was like kind of talking shit about you. And I sent him a message on Facebook like, hey, man, just seeing like, are we, are we cool? Simply that, are we cool? He was like, yeah, yeah, there's no problem at all. Like, okay, are you, are you sure? I just want to make sure. He's like, yeah, no, we're good, buddy. You know, and then he went back to the mutual friend and was like, hey, you know, Martin messaged me and it was scary. He's scary. Like that. And again, all I said was, are we cool? Because this guy has been saying stuff about me for X amount of weeks. So to kind of uh, see that 
play out in real time of someone turn me into the aggressor, turn me into the, oh, what's, what's he going to do? I'm nervous about, it's like, it's first off, it's over fucking Facebook. It's a Facebook message. I don't know what you, do you think I can like jump, like, what's it, uh, reboot? Like jump right. through yeah. the computer <laughs> and get into your home? It's like, no. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a very passive person, passive aggressive in, in some contexts as well, but I'm, I try to, again, rationalize situations or talk to a person about it. And the fact that even in trying to hold that conversation to ask what someone else's problem is with me, and then I am known as scary for doing so, that, that tells you, again, how ingrained racism is in a lot of people here in America. Yeah, and that that is kind of I think that that's been another yet another awakening is just how deep seated it all is, going back years and years and years, and how it evolves. You know whether it was the, you know the Southern strategy starting with Nixon, where it's all these buzzwords where you think you when you think of a black person, it is you know uh, thug, inner city, uh, gang violence, like urban. all these urban, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, it's just, it's so ingrained into how people's gut reaction is that, you know, you, you're judged before you say or do anything. Yeah. Um, and so how do we, <laughs> now we're going to solve this here, but <laughs> you know, what can, <laughs> what's the starting, like where, how can we take, utilize this moment? What's the, the launching pad that we can slowly chip away at these prejudices um I, I think in a in one sense we have to recognize where that came from like recognize why we hold these prejudices why we have these kind of stereotypes built in and why we why we have fear of mm -hmm. someone who looks different right of, of someone who's black of someone who's brown of someone who you know who, who, why, why our brain goes to thug, ghetto, gangster, they're going to rob me. What's he, is he going to rape me? Is he going to shoot me? Is he going to stab me? Whatever. We are people. We are humans. That's, I, I, I don't plan on, you know, like, like this, the scary guy, I wasn't going to beat his ass. Maybe I should have after that, but <laughs> you know, that, that was, that never crossed my mind of like, oh, I should beat this guy, you know? Um, so there's something in him that his mind goes to confrontational black, confrontational black. That means he's going to be violent. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have to like scale back those layers of where did that come from? You know, is it, did it something that my grandfather said? Is it something that I saw in the news is it something I saw on TV figure once we figure that out with, with, with within every individual, and it, it doesn't have to be like some big public thing, no. but just within yourself, figure out where, where are my own prejudices and my own like my own implications of why I'm scared or angry or hateful or whatever towards this person uh, or towards people who look like this person? Where does that come from? Um, figuring that out is step one. Uh, confronting that feeling and even you know holding yourself accountable, apologizing, whatever it may be. I think that's step two. Like I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of people who have reached out and apologized for oh, honestly, shit. I don't even remember. Um, but it, it feels good that in, in a way they remember it or they, you know, uh, that it affected them in some way to where it stuck with them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I think that that's happened like, even like with, with the me too movement uh, a few years back, I, I remember a lot of female friends being like, yeah, all these guys have reached out to me and, apologize for like shitty occurrences and even I did I was like hey you know I was an asshole to you in this relationship or whatever and something that uh and I remember emailing an ex-girlfriend in regards to like just you know again being a shitty cheating boyfriend uh you can listen to our last episode to hear more <laughs> <about that. laughs> um but I remember she said uh you know she she thanked me for reaching out and you know told me how she was feeling but also said you have to be okay with the fact that I hate you and you, mm. and yeah. And I think that's, that's really that the, the fear that so many white people have and 
be it a white ally, be it a, a, the most racist of racist people, or even the like, I'm not racist kind of racist. It's the fear of the, you know, someone hating you because of, because of your actions or the actions that have occurred for the past 400 plus years mm-hmm. and learning to be okay with that. It's like, yeah, we're angry. We're, we're sad. We're, we're, we're taking on a lot and trying to condense it into uh, a Netflix playlist or whatever the fuck, you know? Uh, so I, you know, in a lot of ways we need this moment to be angry and to be sad and to let you guys be uncomfortable with that and also be, and also recognize your own, microaggressions or racism or prejudice or what grandpa said one time five years ago or you know what some you know so many people like oh well i got called a cracker once so that that means that i've also dealt with racism it's like no the fuck you didn't no (laughs) yeah so take those moments and reflect on them and recognize them and see see where your biases lie and how you can grow from that I think that's, that's, that's the big one. Definitely. Uh, I did want to, maybe we could expand a little bit on the article. I believe you wrote it in response to uh, Kobe Bryant's death. Mm -hmm. Um, Was that the Dear White Women? Yes. Headline? Uh, You already kind of mentioned it, but I was wondering if you could just kind of elaborate on, on that article. Yeah. Uh, so after literally minutes after Kobe Bryant's death uh, was announced, I remember I was sitting at a uh, I was sitting in a restaurant, and immediately like on Twitter, as everyone's like, you know, especially in LA, was just trying to figure out what what do you mean? What do you mean Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter accident? And the first thing you know you kind of see is good why are you mourning a rapist why are you da 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 and it's like yo he died with his daughter give it a minute you can sh- you can shut up right now because it just happened it his his he hasn't even been buried he hasn't even been like found found give it a minute before you uh, before you like I- I- expand this anger and and I'm sure that there, you know, people have their reasoning as to what, you know, their their own personal reasons. But like, don't be mad at him. You you if 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 your uncle or ex boyfriend or some guy at a party, whatever, that's that's who you're angry at. Like I've I've got my anger towards police or towards um, you know, various white people in my life. So, something my mom told me though, because I I. I uh, I used to go off on Facebook and, and Twitter and shit like that about white women, but that was because of my anger towards how I was wronged by particular people, you know? And my mom said, well, what do you think, you know, our, our neighbor back home is a white lady. She was like, if she read that, how do you think she's going to think you feel about her? I was like, you're right. She, she's always been kind to me. She's always been good to me. So my anger wasn't towards her or all white women. It was towards this this white lady who yelled at me when I was a kid or the white teacher who made me pee my pants or the, you know, third grade white teacher who, you know, uh, said that th- it's weird that a little white girl is sitting next to me as a little black boy. So I think so often we root our anger towards celebrities because they're, they're an easier target. It's punching up. It's whatever. But like this dude just died. Give it a, give it a moment. Reflect on who you're really mad at. What 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 happened? Whatever in Colorado, it was years ago. Terrible situation. But we know he's we've we've seen the growth and development this man has had since then, mm-hmm. and and so much work and effort he's put into aiding and and voicing women in sports and women athletes, especially his daughters. And I think that's what was so for me frustrating to see like that legacy try to get stripped away immediately it's like again give it a minute it's okay mm. it's okay to just like not have to speak on everything and especially as a black man we don't one we don't have a lot of quote unquote heroes two we don't have a lot of heroes who 
speak on the black experience, but also speak, but also speak on uh, the importance of women in sports and women athletes and women in general. And Kobe was one of the few people who did that. We, we don't allow black men to be forgiven or black men to grow uh, or black men to kind of get out of that, you know, like so often I hear for like white kids, like, ah, oh, boys will be boys. Right. That was, that was even like the thing about Brock Turner where yeah. the judge's whole thing was, Oh, we don't want to ruin his life. We, we as black men aren't oftentimes allowed the clearance of fucking up. And they're, they're like, wow, like fuck R. Kelly. I fuck Bill Cosby sure. guys like yeah. that. But you know, cer- certain times we just need that, that silence to mourn uh, the loss of someone who was learning or who got better because mm-hmm. it, it shows us that we can learn and get better. Well, I think you made a good, a good comparison in that article about uh, it was, what was it? John, John F. Kennedy Jr. was saying that, you know, you don't, you don't define his dad JFK on the fact that he was a serial cheater. Yeah. Um, at all you know like he's given the benefit of the doubt and you know maybe one would argue that he achieved more than kobe bryant but it doesn't matter i think what you're getting at is that oftentimes anybody you know a black man who has achieved a level of success can be defined by that one you know mistake he made or whatever whereas that's generally not you know there's more of a benefit of the doubt with somebody who's white who's at a similar place is that yeah. fair? No, I, I agree. I, I do, have you seen uh, the Last Dance, the Michael yeah. Jordan doc? Yeah. Yeah. So they 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 expounded so much on the uh, the gambling stuff and like, oh, is he a gambling addict? And and even I, I was talking to a friend about it, and he was like, yeah, but like who who hadn't seen the Last Dance at that point? He was like, yeah, but wasn't he like a serial gambler and like he had a real gambling problem and all this stuff? Like, no, this like the the thing he said in it was like, I still have my watch, I still have my house. If I had a gambling problem, these things would not be here. I like mm-hmm. to gamble. There's a difference. Um, and then you know, there, there's and there's so many like white perform like who's it? What's the the Imagine got John Lennon? Mm-hmm. Like he used to beat up Yoko Ono, but we you know we're like ah yeah you know, she yeah. Be- she broke up the Beatles. He made Imagine right. He's in the right. Beatles, so he's you know again we 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 have to we tend to hone in on the one negative aspect that can bring a black man down as opposed to like for, for our white counterparts where that's just like, ah, that's a silly flaw that happened. Yada, yada, yada. Keep it moving. You know? Right. Yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on the, the fact that 95% of all the people who've been out in the streets, it is a peaceful protest. Um, and these aren't scientific numbers, but I would say 5% have been looting and, you know, violence. And I would, I wouldn't even, I don't even know if those should be lumped together because it's all sort of different, but, um, I had a hard time watching the looting and not just instantly saying those are criminals, um, because of what I'm bringing to the table with my experiences. Uh, the more that I've, I've watched, you know, documentaries about, you know, the, uh, the Rodney King riots and all that stuff. What I'm kind of learning is that for a lot of people, that was the boiling point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so maybe talk about, you know, I, I mean, I don't think you were looting, so it's not to get into the head of anybody. Um, but, you know, just the, the, the pressure, the, the, the building up of so many different occurrences where you do get to a point where, you just don't know what else to do. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, uh, one protester said it best of uh, G- George Floyd can't come back. Target can. They can rebuild a target. But you, you can't rebuild the fact that there is a daughter who, whose dad is gone. Yeah. And she, you know, at, at such a young age. Um, same with like, Bri- Breonna Taylor was like a nursing student, if I remember correctly. Yeah. EMT, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's someone who would have been helping and aiding in a lot of what we're seeing and dealing with, uh, whose life is taken away. 
we can get we can build back any store any glass is replaceable you know life isn't um but even even in regards to the looting and all that stuff we've we've seen people who started it like you know the you can blame anti antifa you can blame you know undercover cops like there was the the guy in uh i believe it was in uh minnesota who was smashing the windows out in the auto zone they they found mm -hmm. out he was a cop and all that stuff and you know we've seen like videos and pictures of of cops leaving out random piles of bricks so i think a lot in a lot of ways the people the the establishment for lack of a better term are trying to uh leave out these things or start these things so that way they can sway the narrative so then it doesn't become we need police reform it doesn't become uh you know they killed somebody or you know or even black lives matter becomes oh do you do you see the chaos that's happening here there's fire and they're they're tearing down the target and all these things are just, ah it's scary because that that's the way they have to reframe it. That's the way they have to shape it. So it doesn't become the LA protest. It becomes the LA riots, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it you know, but you, you'll see like, I, I saw one video where they showed like three, three white people who were kind of setting up this, they had a, a cop car randomly. It was an older cop car randomly placed in the middle of the street. And then um, uh, three people were like, three white people were like yeah and they'd break like they'd break the glass and go out and then someone would, like throw like pour a lot of fluid in it and they leave and then someone would like throw fire in it and then they would all just disperse and then now people are like fire yeah fuck yeah yeah that, that's how i'm feeling i'm feeling inflamed let's destroy this car so mm -hmm. then that becomes the imagery you know is uh, of the destruction as opposed to the rebuilding or the reason why this destruction is happening mm -hmm. but you know it's it, it is, it is a boiling point. It is a, a thing of what else, what else do you do? What, what else can you attack? Because we, you know, I, I can't get into the white house. I can't, uh, you know, I can't personally figure out how to go to whatever precinct. Um, but if some shit's right here and that's the shit that you want or you need to see, or that, that will get you to listen to me then sometimes you got to tear it down so people will, you got to tear down that wall so people will listen to who's on the other side of it, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think one of the reasons I was upset watching it live is that I was just instantly thinking as I was watching, you know, black people come out of shoe stores with a bunch of shoes is that you're making it easier for the white people to ignore all the good things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem is that we have to shape a narrative um, where it's like, it's, it's a matter of, of, we have to make all black people seem sympathetic and not show the fact that, you know, that, that there's a reason that this is happening. It gives them an easy target to say, well, look at that. They're looting, you know, like th if they cared about their communities, they wouldn't do. It just changes the whole narrative. And I think that that's kind of the problem is that there's a narrative instead of just facts. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this. Who, yeah. of all the people, you know, yeah. uh, like personally, who's, who's the worst person, you know, you don't have to say their full name, but who's the worst person, you know? God, that's a good question. Uh, Chuck. Okay. Why, why is Chuck bad? Um, I think it's because, uh, he lacks compassion uh, or able to see anything beyond like his front yard uh, or his own experiences. He's quick to judge and point out failures and others before himself. What race is Chuck? White. Right. So Chuck is white and is also able to be known as the worst person you know. Mm -hmm. But you also know good white people, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that, but that doesn't change your perspective on the good white people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we want. We, we don't, we don't want to have to be extraordinary black people and magical black people and like the best and you know, the fastest and the strongest. 
Sometimes we just want to be. I, I like the fact that I'm, I'm a, like, how many fucking black guys, you know, have a bunch of toys on their wall, you know? <laughs> sure. Right? So yeah. th- you're, sometimes you're going to see black people who don't go protest at all. Some black people will go hiking. Some black people are going to steal shoes. But I feel like we just, we need to be able to have that variety of black people without it all being lumped into, ah, oh, but see, they're ruining it. Exactly. They're just there. They're, yeah. they're just, they're reacting. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The the white people at the KKK rally don't represent all white people. Yeah, know? exactly. It's the same yeah. kind of thing. Well, cool, man. Uh, thank you for, for coming on and talking about all this. I just, I think the best thing that we can do is just have conversations, you know, and, yeah. listen. and try and uh, listen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. albeit I'm still one to talk, I guess. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, it is your podcast. You're supposed to talk. A little bit. <laughs> well, that's true. It would be awkward if it was just a monologue of you. For an hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just sat here eating cookies. Yeah. I would, um, be, I would be very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, I was just staring. <laughs> yeah, where can people, you know, uh, follow you on social media and all that stuff and read the, you know, the articles you got coming out and all that stuff? Yeah, follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Martin M. Morrow. That is M-A-R-T-I-N-M, then another M-O-R-R-O-W. Uh, fi- find me on Medium, uh, Martin Morrow. I have other stuff coming out. Uh, and I have a comedy album that's out right now on all streaming platforms called Magic of the City. Awesome, awesome. Well, yeah, that, I got to check that out. Um, yeah, so. thanks so much for coming on. And, uh, you know, hopefully things will get better. Yeah, time will tell. I mean, we yeah. just got to all do the work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you. That was the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. It was, um, it was really great talking with Martin. And, uh, yeah, he's got a, as he mentioned, he has a stand-up special out called Magic of the City, and it's on iTunes and Spotify, so definitely check that out. Uh, you can read his, uh, Martin's articles uh, on, on Medium, just search Martin Morrow, and, um, you know, uh, yeah, check him out. He's got a lot of great things to say, and funny things, too. So, um, yeah, that's all I've got for this week. Let's continue to, to be better and, and to learn and grow and evolve. And uh, until next time, keep laughing.